type of extraneous evidence outside of court, why she would have transmitted the information herself to juror number two, because she certainly knew that juror number two was not supposed to have the information if she herself was not supposed to have the information. So what you have is a situation where you have two separate jurors having information or evidence which really goes to the heart of the case, evidence which was received out of court, um, and it goes to the question of whether or not Angela Bono is an abductor of women, which is really what the whole trial was about. And one thing that I think needs to be pointed out is that in one of the affidavits that we filed by an alternate juror, she reports that she had a conversation with juror number two, in which she said to juror number two, well, certainly if this incident occurred, we'll hear from this potential victim in court. And juror number two said, oh, no, we don't, we won't, because um, this second, uh, or excuse me, this potential victim doesn't want to get involved. Well, that conversation was never denied by juror number two, and it stands uncontroverted that that conversation did occur about a potential victim being out there who somehow doesn't want to show up in court. It's our position that that information um, in possession of two of the jurors can be nothing other than prejudicial to Mr. Bono. And the question really is whether or not that type of remark or that type of evidence could, in fact, have influenced the verdict in this case. And it's our position that it could, in fact, because if there is a perception on the part of, of the jurors, certainly, that there are more victims or potential victims out on the street um, that didn't come in and that could possibly have identified Mr. Bono. And certainly it gives more weight to the pros prosecution's claim that Mr. Bono was, in fact, the hillside strangler. And also the fact that this potential victim was peripherally related to um, a friend of one of the jurors brings the whole situation a lot closer to home and maybe seems more real. Uh, than it would have been had the person actually been brought into court and had there been an opportunity actually to cross-examine the person. Isn't it necessary to view this information uh, in light of the evidence in the case of numerous possible or potential sightings of Mr. Bianchi and Mr. Bono and uh, numerous uh, incidents in which uh, either the sightings were confirmed or discounted as uh, in effect inaccurate. Isn't that really uh, more a reflection of the fact that the juror didn't think it was important in the context of all of the other evidence and that's why she would mention it even if she should technically not have mentioned it to her fellow jurors? Well, you're saying, Your Honor, that you think that the juror, or my perception is that what you're saying is that this first juror did not think that it was important given the, all the other evidence in the case. And I think that if you look substantially at what happened with that information, that that conclusion is erroneous. Because if it was not important, juror number one would not have transmitted it to juror number two. Are you assuming that the jurors communicated only about things that were of central importance in the case? No, I'm not. But what I'm suggesting is that We've all, in the last two years, been parties to conversations at, at parties, social gatherings, work, wherever it is, where uh, people talk about the case. And there are situations where people just kind of drop uh, remarks that just go in one ear and out the other because we know that um, they really are of no consequence. But in this situation, it was not something like that. Because if it had been an inconsequential <coughs> remark, it would have been dropped right there. That's our position. It wouldn't have gone on from juror number one to juror number two. And juror number two apparently thought enough of that information to report it to two alternate jurors in two separate conversations. That's not the type of thing that you hear at a cocktail party and just disregard because it was uh, of no consequence. All right. I think that it's very important also for the court to recognize that uh, in the affidavit of juror number two, who received the information from juror number one, there is no uh, denial in that affidavit, or there is no statement in the affidavit that she disregarded that information. She says it wasn't discussed in jury deliberations, but she doesn't say that it had no effect upon her thought processes, which is different than what the affidavit of juror number one said when she said that she disregarded the information. There is nothing in the affidavit of juror number two that says that she disregarded that information or thought 
that it had no substance. <clears throat> There's no information in, in the affidavit of juror number two that when she was told the information by juror number one, that she was told that it was just a passing remark and that it wasn't important. The fact that, that juror number two told the alternates and the fact that the alternates remembered this information a year and a half later, I think is a, another uh, piece of information circumstantially which would um, lead, the, lead a reasonable person to think that it was said um, by juror number two with enough uh, validity that the two alternate jurors who heard the information, who heard it separately, um, thought, about, thought enough about it to remember it a year and a half after the remark occurred. And also, I would bring up to the court that since this information did get transmitted at the beginning of the trial, the court's last remarks about uh, whether or not there had been so many other uh, sightings as to make the uh, information kind of irrelevant um, would not be applicable because in the beginning of the trial, the jurors would not have been aware of the numerous sightings as they would have been maybe a year or so down the line. I'm not sure which way that cuts. Uh, one could certainly view it as being obliterated uh, for all practical purposes by the 400 witnesses or so who followed. <clears throat> next example or the next uh, major area of juror misconduct which we have alleged is remarks made by two separate jurors prior to the deliberations that they felt that Angela Bono was guilty. Now, one of the remarks has been countered by a counter affidavit, and that is the remark regarding the, uh, the dream, and uh, in which one, in which an alternate juror claims that she heard a juror come into court one day, or come into the jury room one day and say, uh, I had a dream the night before in which Mr. Bono was found not guilty, and that disturbs me to some extent because I think he should be found guilty. Um, and the beginning of that conversation about the dream was heard by another alternate juror who um, also wrote an affidavit. Now, the juror who um, they claim said this has denied it, and of course that's a factual determination for, for you to make. Um, and I mean, I would only I would only bring up one point, which is that there was the an allegation made by one of the alternate jurors that another juror was present and heard this conversation, or, or actually participated in the conversation, and that juror's uh, there was no affidavit provided to the court by that juror denying that conversation. So uh, there is a, a, an allegation before the court that there was a person there who heard that information, and that allegation has not been controverted by counter affidavit. Now, to go to the other example, we have another juror who, on a number of occasions, according to several of the alternate jurors made remarks that Mr. Bono was guilty. These remarks occurred in several different contexts. The first remark was that Mr. Bono was guilty because of what she had heard about this friend uh, and the possible abduction. Now, uh, she denies, there's been a counter affidavit filed by, by the juror number two who is the person who was claimed by the alternate jurors to have made that statement. She denies the statement that she, that Angela Bona was guilty, that she said, she didn't say Angela Bona was guilty because of the friend, but she acknowledges she did make the statement about the friend. We have another statement that uh, the alternate jurors claim that this particular juror made, which was that the defendant would, the defense, excuse me, would get Angela Bono off on technicalities. And I would call your attention to the affidavits um, uh, because the juror who allegedly made that statement never denied that she made that particular statement. And I think that, that impliedly in that statement that the defense is going to get Angela Bono off on, on technicality, there is a statement that Angela Bono is guilty, um, but that he's going to get off. And if it, if it was that statement standing alone that the defense is going to get Angela Bono off on technicalities. Um, 
it wouldn't be as significant. But I think that what the court has to do is take that statement and fit it together with the other statements made allegedly by this same juror um, in two separate conversations with two alternate jurors in which it's alleged that the same juror who said that defense was going to be able to get Angela Bono off on technicalities said that Angela Bono was guilty, but the prosecution couldn't prove it. And it all kind of fits together. And this statement uh, was made not just once, but according to the alternate jurors on several occasions by this same juror, and it was all made prior to deliberations. And if the court looks at the counter affidavit filed by the juror who was accused of making these statements, again, she does not completely deny making that particular statement that Angela Bono is guilty but the prosecution can't prove it. She says that she said something like, well, if Angela Bono is guilty, the prosecution would have a hard time proving it, which I would suggest to the court is a statement that's made <coughs> um, after she knows what the issue is and when she, in a, during a period of time when she's probably distressed, which I think um, has come out a little bit through the affidavits, by what has been going on and what people are saying about her and, and is an attempt to perhaps distance herself uh, from the statements that these other people have suggested that she made. Couldn't that just be a reflection of the fact, uh, well established by now by the evidence, that as to each murder there were three witnesses, one the defendant who didn't have to testify, another one Mr. Bianchi, and we know the problems with Mr. Bianchi's testimony, and third the dead girl. You can look at it that way, Your Honor, but I think what you have to look at is that this, it's interesting that of all the jurors in the case, the allegations about making a statement that Angela Bono is guilty but the prosecution can't prove it, or the defense is going to get Mr. Bono off on technicalities, or Angela Bono is guilty because of uh, this incident with the friend of one of the jurors, it's, isn't it an interesting coincidence that all of these statements are allegedly made by one particular juror? And they're made in different conversations, they're made in different contexts, and I think if you put them all together, um, I think what you have is an expression of, of guilt by one of the jurors, uh, which was improper. <coughs> and without going into the law, because we cited it, numbers of cases uh, in which the court has, appellate courts have in fact granted new trials on situations that are very similar to this, where jurors have in fact um, made statements only on one occasion um, to other jurors uh, that indicate that they have a belief in the defendant's um, <coughs> guilt prior to deliberation. <coughs> and the fact that it's only one juror, of course, the court again is aware of the law that, that Mr. Bono is entitled to the independent judgment of, of all 12, and just the fact that it's one, uh, one's enough. <coughs> I'd like to address one other issue that the uh, prosecution has brought up, uh, which kind of goes outside the app. Well, the, the issue is bias. And the issue is that the, the prosecution has claimed that, that the alternate jurors or the persons who, who made um, these allegations and reported this con these conversations uh, were biased that they didn't like the verdict. And I, I guess the implication is by the prosecution is that they, they um, were making things up um, just to, to mess up the trial. Uh, I don't think that there's any question in reading the, um, some of the affidavits that the alternate jurors were in fact disappointed um, and expressed their disappointment with the verdict. But I think that if you think logically about what happened and what happens probably in people's thought processes is, is because they were disappointed and they weren't there and they didn't have a chance to deliberate, um, they might start thinking back over the course of the trial and try to remember incidents which occurred in which they thought that the jurors, some of the jurors might have been unfair, um, which I think is a very natural and, and human reaction. I don't think that there's any reason to believe that just because they're disappointed by the verdict that would cause them to fabricate incidents. In fact, I think that the evidence shows that they didn't fabricate any of these incidents that they talked about. Um, and the fact is that they gave fairly accurate um, reports of conversations that had occurred many months before. This incident that they reported about uh, the friend of, of the jury attempted 
victim of an abduction, it, it did happen. I mean, the conversation did occur, and it did occur a year and a half before, and their reports about it were, in fact, accurate. Um, I think it's logical, and thinking back, trying to understand um, why the jury, or some of the jurors might have arrived at the verdict, um, that that might have come to mind. Uh, the fact that they accurately reported another incident in which one of the jurors apparently had a, a relative who was on trial uh, for murder in the same courthouse during the period of time that, that this case was going on, uh, which was again not reported to the court, and uh, which I believe Mr. Chalik will discuss a little bit later, uh, that's another example of the alternate jurors having an accurate memory as to what this particular juror had told them during the course of the trial. The fact that, that they reported that one of the jurors, juror number two, made a, made a number of um, allegations regarding the guilt of um, Mr. Bono, it's interesting that, in fact, this particular juror did um, make a comment which um, the court has said um, could be interpreted in a different way, but um, the, the juror did, in fact, make a comment about guilt. Uh, I don't think that there's any evidence at all that any of the alternate jurors fabricated any of the information that they wrote down in their affidavit. The only evidence really is that they were upset and they were disappointed. They felt that Mr. Bono didn't get a fair trial because of the evidence that was received out of court regarding this friend um, and the attempt at the abduction and the statements that were made by two of the jurors about guilt, and they wanted to bring that to the court's attention. Uh, I would submit it at this point. All right. Now, you've indicated then, I guess, that Mr. Chalip will cover some other well, point or points. Basically for the rebuttal. Oh, all right. I'd just like to say one thing. In relation to the issue of uh, the person who was on trial in the other courtroom and what the facts of that case were, Mr. Collins just had a conversation with Ms. Ray, and I have an affidavit that I just wrote for Mr. Collins, which he signed, which gives the case. She gave him the name of her nephew, and we have the case file in this courtroom. And if the court will review the case and the case file, the court will see that if the facts are consistent with, which, with that which are stated within the affidavit of the uh, alternate jurors that we supplied in that there wasn't a situation where there was, it was a felony murder case. There was one person who was the, quote, shooter, unquote, and the others were not, and the others were just sort of there or knew about it. And that uh, that is corroborates what the uh, what was said in the affidavit by the alternate jurors, and uh, it would seem to me that it would be very hard for them to know that unless they were told that by the juror in question. I would like to offer the court this affidavit. I'll show All it right, to you. To show it first to Mr. Bourne and Mr. Nash and then file it with the clerk. Otherwise, I will wait and respond. So I take it that your position is that by reason of the point that you make and Mrs. Mater uh, makes that the defendant's uh, right to a fair trial was uh, impaired. Uh, by reason of his not having 12 impartial jurors. I think the point we're making is that the information we received as stated and that the cases that were read when a juror makes a, expresses an opinion about the guilt or innocence of someone prior to the completion of all the evidence, argument, and instructions in the case, that that's improper. It seems to me that the case law in the state of California is, is, is not in any way ambiguous on that, it is clear. Not only that, but this court repeatedly stated to the jurors to not form or express any opinion about the guilt or innocence of Mr. Bono and not to discuss in any way any of the evidence that had been received until the case was completed. And the courts uh, from the California Supreme Court on down have historically interpreted, first of all, that admonition is being required by, I believe it's Civil Procedure Code Section 611, and that that... 1122 of the Penal Code as well. Okay. That that uh, admonition has great meaning, and I'm not saying that these jurors intentionally went out of their way to do something untoward. I'm saying that based on the law in the state of California and what happened and what was stated in the affidavits, that portion even that has been uncontradicted, that certain things were said and done that shouldn't have been done, 
And that people may have formed an opinion before there was a chance for the defense to finish, to argue, and for the instructions to have been read. The main problem in a case like this is when there is a